Mummy Star before sort of today or right. Um, just briefly, Mummy Star was a, a charity that was set up um, six years ago, and it was basically sort of set up on the back of a personal experience that myself and my family had. Um, and I'm going to sort of touch on that as part of this presentation, really, in terms of what sounds bizarre, like, even though it was a, a traumatic experience, there was actually a lot of positives that came out of it as well, in terms of how myself and my family were, were looked after. Um, but I'm going to use it as a way of showing you contrasting care and how when I experienced what should have been a normal pregnancy, the care and the compassion wasn't necessarily, necessarily where we would hope that it would be in terms of a midwifery setting. And just as well then to draw, I think, attention on to sort of dads basically, drawing on some of what Mark Williams talked about today in a far more eloquent, far more friendly sounding lovely Welsh voice that he has. Um, but I'm just going to touch on that and again reinforce that message about why, you know, sort of in the you know, the era that we're working in now, why sort of, you know, taking note and paying attention to, you know, to father's mental health and men's mental health in a, you know, in the wider sense is, is you know, has become so important. Um, and then if there are any questions at the end, you know, please feel free to ask. So just a bit of background. Um, myself and my wife, Meyer, who's, um, from, she was from Bangor. Um, we had a, a little girl already who was three in 2012 when we um, found out that we were pregnant again. Um, and, you know, it was all going swimmingly. We were really excited, looking forward to having, you know, a little brother for Martha. Um, but Maya had started to feel a, an, an aching in her left breast as, as she got to about sort of 21, 22 weeks and just got, you know, quite calmly got referred for a, a routine examination one day when we went in for a, a dating scan. Um, but very quickly it was diagnosed um, by, the, by our team that she had a, you know, quite a significantly sized breast lump. Um, now, you can probably imagine how scary, how uncertain, how, um, you know, how that tipped your whole world on its head when you're looking forward to something so exciting and then all of a sudden you've, you've got all these uncertainties about, you know, are you, know, you going to survive? Is baby going to survive? Can you have treatment during, you know, during pregnancy when it's something that you know, any of us have seldom ever heard of, let alone come across a case you know, in practice? Um, but for us, we, we had a really positive experience in this sense because our, our, our care team were fantastic. They were straight in there reassuring, telling us what we could have, you know, telling us your reassurances about the treatment, the fact that it was safe to have you know, chemotherapy while she was pregnant because she was you know, well into her second trimester because the pregnancy was progressing really, really well. There was no you know, pre-existing issues. Um, and we just, you know, we, we, we cracked on and we, we started having treatment you know, while, while Maya was pregnant. Um, there was, you know, there was the obvious trauma to get through of the fact that our pregnancy, you know, our, our, you know, our second exciting pregnancy had been interrupted. But equally, our midwife who looked after us was, was there straight away and went with everything that got taken away from us with the, with the cancer diagnosis. Our midwife was there to give us something back. So, you know, when we were told we couldn't breastfeed when we'd already breast, breastfed our, our daughter, our midwife was straight away there saying, well, donor milk, we can, we can get you donor breast milk. We can, we can still offer you that, you know, that choice. And again, Never heard of donor milk before. Didn't even know it was the thing that you could do until, you know, until we had this, this appointment. We were, you know, we were offered extra scans. We were offered extra fetal heart monitoring when we went into hospital for chemo so that the chemo, the awful, you know, the treatment day and the, the shadow that that cast over each week suddenly became, oh, we get to go in and hear, you know, baby's heartbeat again today. And, you know, they slowly but surely managed to flip our whole situation on its head and we, we started to enjoy our pregnancy again and we started to, you know, get excited about, you know, sort of our, our baby's going to arrive. Um, and then, you know, routine, you know, as it was for us, we, you know, we were told we were going to get induced a little bit early so that they could manage the treatment that Maya was undergoing. And, you know, Merlin arrived nice and safe, you know, 37 weeks, good healthy weight for, you know, for, the, for that gestation. Um, and for us, that was, you know, we, we'd had, a, we'd had a, a pretty good pregnancy in the end, or, you know, pretty good experience. We'd, you know, he'd arrived healthy. Maya had enjoyed her labor. Um, you know, it's probably maybe not an awful lot of women who might openly say enjoy, but she did. You know, she, she relished the fact that she was able to do that again, and she, she relished the fact that she was able to um, do what she had hoped to do, you know, originally when she found out that she was pregnant again, and she somehow managed to meditate her way through an awful lot of that labor, which, you know, I'm still to this day in kind of in awe of the fact that she was able to remain that calm. Um, now, sadly, Maya's story doesn't end well because she actually then developed a, a really aggressive form of, of secondary cancer to the brain and she actually passed away when, um, when Merlin was, was 10 weeks old. Um, but what I always try and impress on people is that shouldn't overshadow the fact that there was really, really good things for us, the fact that our care was second to none. 
And the sad truth of the matter is that as a charity, we've supported over 600 women to date since we founded five years ago. And I have never seen the type of continuity of care that Maya had in any of those women, which is, that's not the way it should be. You know, every woman should have those kind of little extras, you know, thrown in. Or are they even extras? Are they just us doing our job? Are they, you know, they're not stepping above and beyond, but it's the fact that that kind of care has become, I don't know, maybe rare. We see it as, you know, people going above and beyond, but we just had fantastic midwives just doing the job that they love. And, you know, that's, that's all that any of us can ever ask for. That's not to say we haven't come across some great, great, um, you know, examples. We've had mums who've had water births, hypnobirthing, you know, home births are plenty. Cancer doesn't rule any of that out. Don't, you know, don't be fooled into thinking that a cancer diagnosis does take choice away from mums because it doesn't. It just means we've got to look at things from a different angle. So, um, but what subsequently happened, you know, Maya's experience of this was, was, you know, was really, really positive and that she enjoyed her pregnancy. Um, Mark touched on this earlier. I'm going to touch on it again. I did what men do. I just shut up and pretended I could cope with everything and I just, you know, sort of rallied round and I did everything I could for Maya, made sure she was okay and I made sure that everything was okay for Martha because her mum was, you know, was ill and she was seeing her mum go through changes. Both, you know, scary for, you know, a sibling to see you know, mum pregnant and knowing, you know, that there's a, you know, a sibling coming along at the best of times. But when you see your mum lose her hair and you see your mum look pale and you see your mum, you know, having to spend an awful lot of time in bed, that's, that's worrying for a little kid. Um, you know, luckily for us, Martha was, you know, she was really articulate. So she'd, she'd talk about how she felt. And if she was worried, she'd say she was worried. And if she was scared, she'd, you know, she'd say. And if she was wondering why mummy suddenly went to bed yesterday with hair and then today she looks like an egg, we'd tell her why mummy's head looked like an egg. But that was, you know, that was Martha's way, and, and you know, we, we encouraged that, and we, you know, we sort of, you know, we, she just kept talking all the way through. For me, um, I guess I probably didn't realise the greater impact of everything that we were, we had gone through, and that I went through at the time, and you know, even during the pregnancy, and after after you know, Maya had given birth to Merlin, I was. I suppose so held up in the fact that you know I needed to be strong for Maya and I needed to be strong for Merlin and show him that his daddy was there even when mummy was too tired and what was actually building in reality was this this huge big ball of stress of you know am I actually coping and am I even look how am I supposed to look after Maya when I can't even look after myself and it got to the point and I kind of I, I tweeted one of the quotes from, from Mark's talk earlier on of you know we've got to get away from this this thing of men feeling being afraid to tell somebody that they're they're you know, they're, they're struggling for fear of worrying that other person. A lot of the issue that we had, and I, I've subsequently come to see this with other women that we support through the charity, some of the biggest issues that our mums have isn't their cancer diagnosis, it's not fear about baby, it's the fact that their partner is clearly struggling but he will not talk to her and she's worried about him and that's what's causing her more of the anxiety than, you know, than anybody sort of really takes into account. And I did exactly the same. When I finally broke, and I literally did, I just had a, just had a meltdown one day, you know, it was Maya that was just like, I'm so glad you've actually openly said that you're struggling because you know, there's no point in carrying on. And it goes back to what I said just before about if we can't look after ourselves, we're not in a position to look after anybody else. That setting, I say that now and I take time out every now and again in terms of the women that we support because if I'm struggling or I'm having a week of, I don't know, challenging things come up or memories come up, I'm not in a position to support another woman who's going through this, so I will deliberately, you know, backstep away from the charity to a degree. But that, that obviously leaves, that leaves trauma and it leaves, you know, it leaves, you know, sort of black sort of, you know, parts of your memory and things that you might not necessarily sort of realise are actually there until, you know, you may be are lucky enough to experience a pregnancy again. Now, throughout all of this, pregnancy wasn't something I ever really entertained again. I thought, you know, I deal with pregnancy every day. I'm lucky enough to, you know, to work with midwives all over the country. I get to share the joy of loads of different mums having, you know, babies despite, you know, the, the trauma that they're going through with cancer. So I just didn't think I'd ever, you know, be, be a dad again. Um, and what subsequently happened was I met Nick, um, two years ago, and we'd, we'd been good friends for a while, but, you know, we, we eventually then we decided, right, there's more to this than friendship. There's, and, and bizarrely, she actually used to live over, uh, behind me in, the, in a different house, and never even realised she lived there for a long time. Um, but we got together, and then quicker than we'd probably expected, we got pregnant, um, which was fantastic. Nick didn't have children herself already. Um, you know, we wanted to have a child, if, you know, if we could. And I guess it was only, it was only once we were pregnant then a lot of things suddenly started to creep out and it was like, oh shit, we're, 
I'm pregnant again. I'm going to be a dad. I'm going to, I'm going to go through this. What's, you know, and all of a sudden, things started coming out. It's like scared. You know, this is uh, the last time I went through a pregnancy. This happened. Is that going to happen to Nick again? Is she going to have cancer? Is she going to die after baby's born? Um, and, what, and, and as the pregnancy then advanced, we then started coming up against things like you'd go into your, you'd go into your, um, you know, your routine appointments, you go into your 12-week appointment, you go for your 20-week scan. And what was really sad was that this was a normal pregnancy. Nick, Nick was healthy throughout. She had, you know, she, she had Flynn, and Flynn's you know, really healthy, six months old now. But not once during that pregnancy did anybody, and I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not belittling the importance, obviously, of Nick. Of course, she was regularly checked in on by everybody who saw her. But given the background to our family, given the background to this particular hospital that we were treated, which is where my wife was treated, and where you'd basically, you'd have to have been hidden in a, in a dark room for the last five years to have not known what's happened. Not one person asked me throughout that whole pregnancy how I was, which I, I find quite astonishing. And it's, I, suppose, I, got, I don't know whether it's an issue of uh, on the top of notes, there should be something that says bereavement, you know, that has happened, or I don't know, like you would necessarily, you'd put a sticker on if there's been previous baby loss, you know, with a family when they're going through a pregnancy, and why isn't there something for bereavement or previous traumatic birth, or it doesn't have to be bereavement, it could be previous pregnancy involved emergency C-section or heavy postpartum bleed or something that could have caused trauma. Um, the process of watching your partner give birth is traumatic in a sense, in that you watch somebody you love go through pain. So, you know, these things maybe should be noted. But what was alarming was somebody sat with us and said, oh, right, so tell us about the situation. You know, so she said to Nick, so is this your first baby? Um, and, you know, and Nick said, oh, well, it's, um, she said, we, we, ha we have two children already, but this is my first, you know, which is, a, it's, she talks about, you know, my kids like that, and it's really, you know, I love it. Rather than pick up on that, though, I was then glared at. They live with you? And, and it almost suddenly, it was like, well, yeah, dad capable of looking after children on his own. Shocker. And if, if it had been a woman sat in front of her, and she'd said, yeah, I've got two children already, but I live on my own, nobody would have batted an eyelid. And that's really sad that in this day and age, with all the blended families that you will come across, and that we do come across, and those that we know, and those that we're part of, we still haven't accepted the fact that there are different circumstances or, you know, the woman that lives up the road who's divorced and lives with her two children, you know, she just does what she does. I'm a dad who lives on, lived on my own for two years with my two children, but I was doing a fantastic job bringing up those two children. I was doing so well given the circumstances. So she, because she went through a horrible divorce, but nobody commends her on how well she's doing. But in a pregnancy setting, the same kind of presumptions exist but rather it then reversed, and it was that thing of being stared at as if I had two heads. It was like, yes, my children live with me. I have brought my babies up. Um, you could just say, oh, what's the background? What's, tell us about your family. And then you would quickly, you wouldn't get, I wouldn't give somebody war and peace, but I would certainly say, oh, yeah, my wife died, you know, sort of po you know, postpartum uh, five years ago. That's all you need to know. You don't need to delve into the detail. You don't even need to know what she died from. You just need to know that she passed away and there was, you know, there had been issues in the past but that didn't happen. So yeah, I was greeted as a, a bit of a stranger in the room. Um, so yeah, no follow up, no, you know, hope you're okay. If you need anything, check in or anything. And then it came to things like 20 week scans, same line of questioning, same look from, a, from, the, from the stenographer, same odd questions and a bit of a funny like, oh, right, okay. And that, but that didn't just have an impact on me, that really spoiled Nick's one, you know, sonography appointment, that first time that she actually properly got to meet our baby. And that really left a, like a mental scar on her because she felt like everything just went by in a blur because she felt like it had been interrupted by poor communication, poor mannerisms, the lack of a gentle inquiry as to, you know, tell us about your, you know, your family or are, your other, are the other two looking forward to having a little brother or sister, anything like that. But the whole experience was actually really rushed as well, so we didn't even get to properly look at the different parts of Flynn when we were showing them on the screen. Um, so again, it kind of all combines into a, a kind of a general lack of care, but lack of compassion, which I think is why everybody goes into this job because they're compassionate. You know, if you did it for the money, you'd be doing the wrong job. You go into it because you want to you be part of you know, that, fantastic, that amazing experience that families go through. So, you know, we did, you know, we did make a complaint. We got re-scanned. We had a lovely second scan and we got to know every little bit of, you know, Flynn's, you know, anatomy from one end to the other to the point that they said his legs are far too long. You know, he's clearly going to run like you do. Um, 
But we did. The, the rest of it was fantastic. We got, actually, we were delivered by a really close friend of ours who um, has been through cancer and pregnancy herself years ago, um, has become a midwife following the great experiences she had from her midwife. Um, and she gave, you know, she delivered our, our little boy. Bizarrely, he arrived on my wife's birthday, which was, in a lot of people's eyes, that could have been like, oh God, that's a bit close to home. For us, it felt like a real, like a complete, like a completed circle, if you like. Um, and the, the, you know, the, the old two are obviously thinking, right, double cake every time the 6th of March comes around, you know, we can have two different birthdays. Does that mean we get to have two different sets of presents? But all in, it, I think it was just disappointing to go through that. And you're thinking, how the hell did I go through a cancer experience? But the pregnancy was really, really positive and the maternity care was really fantastic. Yet we go through a pregnancy at the same hospital five years later with no issues whatsoever and yet the memory of that is completely different. And that's, that's obviously on both parents, but you know, I'm obviously telling you, know, sort of telling you this from, a, from the perspective of a dad's side of fear of birth, because I think, I think we talk about um, fear of birth or tocophobia, you know, rightly so. We talk about it in a female sense, you know, in terms of that process of going through birth and, you know, and, and you know, your fears all of it, and you know, I don't know, maybe whether you're scarred from a previous experience, I think equally, this, this you know, creates fear of birth. Cancer and pregnancy will, you know, will have that, fear of mum's health. But I think from a dad's point of view, it's fear of mum, for, sorry, fear for mum's health, fear for baby, in terms of whether baby you know, is gonna be safe throughout all of this. You know, despite all the reassurances, you've always got that, that niggling, God, this is such an unusual situation, what happens if? Um, and in my case, what if, you know, what if I lose my loved one? Again, you know, after another pregnancy, am I gonna be bringing a baby up? again on my own every situation you'll come across is going to be completely and utterly unique whether it is a family where there are divorcees whether there's been previous bereavement it could be a guy who comes into you whose new partner is pregnant but even though he's been divorced 10 years ago his previous partner and their child was born as you know it could have been you know traumatic like, like mark described she could have been she could have been rushed off in front of his eyes and he could have not known whether she was alive or dead that could be his one memory of pregnancy and 10 years on, he's experiencing pregnancy again, and that could be, you know, how do we address the fact that he's been through that? And it's just, I, d I don't know what the answer is. Is it just a case of just noting, you know, previous traumatic birth, check with dad every now and again, something. But I think it goes beyond the pregnancy. It's even more pronounced, I think, with the postpartum care as well. So we had a health visitor come to the house, knows all about Mummy Star, told, sat there on the couch for half an hour telling me how much she thinks the charity is absolutely wonderful. Didn't once ask me how I was. And I was, <laughs> she walked out of the house and I was like, not quite sure where the balance was lost in that conversation. But, you know, it's, it's that thing of checking in. But again, there doesn't need to be a bereavement setting. There doesn't need to be an immediate traumatic history within that, that, that setting. Can that question not get asked of any dad who's just become a dad for the first time? Even more dads who've just become for, for the first time because it is scary. You know, I, was, I went to baby massage class last Saturday with, with Lynn. Um, and there was six of us, I think five of whom had become dads for the first time. And a few of them, you know, rarely, the guy, they were talking to each other. It was great. They were opening conversation that wasn't facilitated by the woman who was doing the massage. They were asking each other, you know, how are they finding it? You know, is it a big transition? How scary have you found being a new dad? And they were being really open and honest. And I was sat there really encouraged by that, thinking this, this is what dads need to do. This is what they need to not be afraid to do is say, Yes, it's really scary. Yes, I don't quite know what I'm doing half the time. But even more so, yes, I'm not sure whether I've bonded or not. That's, you know, that's, that's quite taboo for a, for a guy to turn around and say that is, you know, is, 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 is really, really hard. But one of the guys did say it. He, he said he worries about bonding. I did it with Merlin. I didn't bond with Merlin for about the first three months, probably not until Maya died, because I was so hell-bent on making sure that she was OK. I couldn't focus on him whatsoever. And, even now, thinking back, I have, I have real, you know, sadness in the fact that I didn't sort of give Merlin what I now give Flynn. And sometimes when, you know, in, in the months that have passed since Flynn has been born, I think it's brought a lot into, into stark contrast in terms of, you know, as a dad, what I found, a big, the biggest transition I found was actually, and it sounds odd, um, getting used to looking after a baby, not on your own. And I found that really sad because I got so used to... Um, how can I describe it? So used to doing everything, so used to being his everything because he had nobody else that could, you know, that could help him, that could support him, could change him, could feed him, could, you know, anything. 
when Flynn suddenly arrived, it was, you know, I'd, I'd have Nick saying, I'll take him, so, you know, it's fine. If you need to go and do something, I'll take him. And I would literally hold on to him for the, with the fear of God in me thinking, I, I don't want to let go of him. And she'd be like, it's fine. You know, you're not the only one. And it, it took, probably took the best part of three months to get used to the fact that it wasn't just me. Um, and you think on the outside, you probably think, but that should have been so welcome, the fact that it wasn't just you this time. But it actually was, it had the reverse impact. It was quite scary to suddenly have to relinquish, to be able to relinquish, you know, total responsibility from, you know, from that child. Um, I'm not saying it's all gone. I still have, you know, I still have my wobbles with, you know, with him because of, I'm used to, you know, when he wakes up in the night and I can't settle him, I feel utterly useless. But that's because he gets breastfed by Nick. So he's used to being able to have that comfort. Whereas I never had to offer Merlin, you know, the breast because, well, he's, you know, his mum wasn't able to. So he just got used to a bottle from the start. It's quite hard to get used to the fact that, you know, Flynn can't do that with me now, whereas Merlin could. But equally, I can give him things that I didn't necessarily give Merlin at the same stage in his life. So it, it brings, you know, it brings comparisons inadvertently. You don't want to do it. None of us want to do that with our kids. But in these situations, it becomes kind of something that just creeps in and it's quite hard to, you know, to keep tabs on. Um, but again, just going back to the, the sort of the, the families generally, I think when you do see, you know, families in this situation, I think it is, it's important to just take an interest in, you know, in, in everybody to find out a little bit about what everybody does. And I know, I know you're pressed for time, okay? I'm not, you know, sort of trying to miraculously, you know, sort of create an extra 10 minutes per appointment. But it is that thing of just sort of, just checking in or just giving dad a look and just seeing if he is okay and sort of going back and not being afraid to ask or probe a little bit. Um, avoid presumption like that midwife unfortunately didn't do. You know, she, she presumed very quickly. Um, but it is always just keep in mind, you, you won't necessarily and it will not be obvious to you straight away what has gone before for that family and you are starting from scratch. You are that family's opportunity to start to have a clean slate. So let's just try and, you know, do your best to try and make sure this is as as memorable, you know, an experience for that family as, you know, as it can be. So thank you very much.